What's up, everybody? I'm Justin. Zach. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. And if you have a Bible or Bible device, go ahead and grab that. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 10. And this is really the only place we're going to be this evening. We may look at some other passages as the Spirit lays them on our hearts and, frankly, uh, as we remember them. But really, we're just going to work on this one chapter. We are going to study the entire chapter this evening. And I realize that sounds daunting given how deep Daniel can get. But with that being said... Daniel chapter 10 is really a setup chapter for chapter 11. So while there are 21 verses here, and we certainly could spend a lot of time in it, we are going to do the best that we can do and, and set ourselves up for the study of chapter 11, which we'll start next week. So what we are going to do is read all of Daniel chapter 10, and then we'll pray and we will review slightly, and then we will continue on. So let's read Daniel chapter 10, starting in verse 1. It says this, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the three full weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face was like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision. But a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words." The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for the days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute, and behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And, he spoke, and as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. Let's go to God in prayer here. Father, we come before you and we're thankful for opportunities to gather around your word. I pray that we don't take these moments for granted. I pray that we are overwhelmed when we worship you corporately, but I pray we are equally as overwhelmed by who you are when we're alone with you, with your word. I pray that you open our hearts to receive this and use this time. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, if you're the kind of person that likes closure, I'm deeply sorry for what we're getting ready to get into because as with other chapters, Daniel 10 poses more questions than it answers. There are several things that happen here we really don't know about, and the events that are described here aren't actually explained here. They're explained in the next chapter. You must keep this in mind, and this is something that will help you as you continue to study the scriptures. 
the chapter and verse numbers that you see in the scriptures, right? Big numbers, chapter, little numbers, verse, just if you're new to studying scripture, uh, those were not originally included in the text. Actually, those are fairly modern additions based on how old the Bible is. Those were added in the Middle Ages to be able to help people navigate the scriptures. So originally, this would have just flown as uh, flowed as one work. Okay, so chapter 10 and chapter 11 would have been the same. It wouldn't have been broken up like this. But because it is, we can say that chapter 10 is the setup, chapter 11 is the actual vision. Now, this vision or message, prophecy, whatever you want to say that happens in chapter 11, is going to concern a time of a testing of faith for Israel. In other words, it's going to concern the time when they go back home and they start back over. There's going to be an incredibly large amount of turmoil that happens there. But We'll save that for next week. Once again, this is just kind of the setup for what's happening here. Daniel is going to get visited by some visitors here, right? He, he's going to get visited by some visitors. Boy, that was a sentence. He's going to get visited by some unknown visitors is what I mean. And there are several theories as to who this could be, but ultimately we're not going to give a straight answer because it's very difficult within like Bible scholarship to say with absolute certainty who these people are. And that's one of the things that makes studying the Bible so interesting is there's so many things we just can't explain. And, and that's perfectly okay because we have what God has revealed to us. And if we figure stuff out because God's revealed more to us, then that's fine. But if we don't, this is what he wanted us to know. So with that being said, let's begin walking through this. We're just going to take it one step at a time. Zach and I ping-ponging back and forth on comments about this. By the way, if you haven't checked out the other Daniel videos up to this point, make sure that you go do that mm -hmm. so that you get all of the information up to this point. Daniel has been praying really hard for a long time, and he's begun to get answers to these prayers. Now he's going to be given some more information beyond the prayer that we studied back in chapter 9. So let's jump in here. Daniel 10, uh, we will start here in verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar, and the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. So in these introductory remarks, we are now back in the modern context. So mm -hmm. within the last couple of visions that Daniel has gotten, he has described getting those visions when other past kings were ruling. Mm -hmm. Now we're back into the timeline moving forward. So remember, the Babylonians got taken out by the Medes, who made way for the Persians under this guy named Cyrus. Historically, if you want to study this, he's known as Cyrus the Great, and he's the guy that lets the exiled people of Judah go back home. But they're not free. Right. They're still under Persian control, even though they are allowed to go back. At mm -hmm. this point, they've been in exile for about 70 years, Okay, and this is apparently the third year after Cyrus has now taken over. Because remember, you get the Babylonian kings taken out and Darius, the Mede, starts ruling. Mm -hmm. Darius is kind of a band-aid until Cyrus finishes fighting the wars and can get there. So this is now three years after Cyrus has gotten there, which perfectly corresponds to another book of the Bible that we need to talk about here. So if you've never, ever read the book of Ezra before, you definitely should. And you should read Nehemiah. Now, why do we say those together? Because when they were written, they originally were together. They were separated long after they were written, probably due to scroll length, right? Because remember, Ancient books are not written in codex form, mm -hmm. book with a spine. They're written in scrolls, and some of them are very large, so they get separated. That could mm -hmm. be the reason Ezra and Nehemiah are split, but originally it was just called Ezra and Nehemiah, okay? And those books concern the return of the Israelites from exile. So remember, they don't all go back at once. I don't want you to think like Cyrus says the people can return, and there's just another mass exodus of people. What you end up finding is that not a lot of people end up going back in comparison to those who were taken into captivity. Now, they've been there 70 years. Some of those people had died and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But you have three waves of people by three different leaders. First wave of, of exiles is led by Ezra. They go back. Oh, I'm sorry. First, first wave is led by a guy named Belshazzar. Or, or no, I'm sorry, Zerubbabel. Mm -hmm. They all get confused. Zerubbabel leads them back. He rebuilds the temple. Second wave is led by Ezra. They 
continue to build the temple, but he also starts to teach the Torah again and rebuilds the community. Then Nehemiah leads the third wave back and they start to rebuild the walls. So this is happening. Daniel chapter 10 verse 1 corresponds with Ezra chapters 1 and 2. So if you have time, definitely read this and then go check out Ezra 1 and 2. But Daniel is essentially telling you this is happening at the same time people started to go back home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so kind of getting the scene to where we're at, especially studying Daniel. And when you study Daniel, it can be a little confusing because of the timeline when everything is happening. Uh, but what I love that the Bible does is that it lets us know the setting of the place. And it's taking during a uh, place during King Cyrus's reign, which is this probably 536 B.C., uh, when Cyrus is ruling. And so, um, like before in the prophecy coming, uh, especially if you look back at the beginning visions that were revealed to Daniel, is the Babylons would rule, and then now the Meadow Persians would rule. Now, so you see the Persians taking over. It's in the Persian reign. But King Cyrus uh, uh, allows uh, remnants of the Israelites to return back to kind of build kind of their home life, whether it be the temples, their homes, uh, like Justin said, the city walls. And so they're returning back. And in that, uh, and within this chapter, we're going to see Daniel kind of get almost this final vision of the things that come, especially what is to happen with Israel. So you notice too, it says, and the word was true and it was a great conflict. What he means is the vision he's getting ready to get is about a great conflict. Mm -hmm. Okay. So God is not being confusing and mm -hmm. conflicting. He's not a God of confusion. Mm -hmm. What he's saying is the vision I got was about something that was difficult for me to handle, right? Mm -hmm. It was about a great conflict. Mm -hmm. Look here, starting in verse two. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for three full weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearing appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. So, several things happening here. First thing you notice, it says, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. Daniel has been praying for three weeks. This has been a time of very, very persistent prayer. So put a pin in that because we're going to come back to that here in a mm -hmm. second. Question is, that word mourning, grieving, what in the world does he mean? Why would he be mourning during, during this time? If the Israelites are allowed to go back home, why is he mourning? Well, scholars are divided as to what he could actually be mourning, although um, there's, there's a, two really big guesses. And one of the two, if not both, could be, could be the case. It could be that Daniel's mourning because not a lot of people went back to the promised land. A lot of people decided they were just going to stay in Persia. That's one reason. The other reason, when Ezra goes back and starts to help rebuild the temple and rebuild the community, he faces an incredible amount of opposition, and maybe Daniel's gotten word of that. So it could be that Daniel's mourning because not a lot of people went back or because Ezra and Zerubbabel faced a lot of opposition. Mm -hmm. Either one of those or both could be true. We're not exactly sure. But it's heavy on his heart because Daniel doesn't go back. Okay, he doesn't go back with them because at this point, most scholars think he's about 84 years old and he can actually better serve Israel in his high government position in Persia than he could if he were to go back to Jerusalem. Because remember, the people in Jerusalem have to completely rebuild again. Mm -hmm. He's not going to have any position for a long time. There is no positions. They have to completely start their society over, whereas they don't have to do that where Daniel is in Persia. So mm -hmm. he's mourning and he's not eating much, right? He is eating some, but he's not eating any delicacies. He's not eating like a lot of meat. He's not drinking a lot of wine. Some people have called this fasting. This is not fasting, okay? It would be incorrect to call this fasting because the biblical concept of fasting is when you don't eat at all, right? No food, just water for a period of time. He is eating some stuff, so we cannot call this fasting. What we can do, though, is call this a time of self-denial, okay? He is denying himself eating some food that he may otherwise eat so that he can be focused uh, on what's going on. And in the course of time, he sees an individual before him. Now, here's the big question, folks. 
Who is this person? Okay, uh, I want to read really quickly here, uh, verse 5. So Daniel is standing on the bank of the Tigris. There are basically two main rivers that engulf this part of the world. Okay, if you've taken an ancient history class, you've heard this called the Fertile Crescent. Right, Mesopotamia means land between the rivers. You've got the Tigris, which is what he's standing on here. The other one is the Euphrates, okay? He's standing on the banks of the Tigris, and he says, he sees, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist, okay? The, the question is, who is this guy, okay? And I'll be straight with you, and if you get upset, I apologize, we have no idea, right, who, who this individual is. There are a couple of theories, though. It could be that this guy is Jesus, right, Jesus coming and appearing before Daniel. There is some evidence to support that, because the way that this individual in Daniel 10 is described is very, very close to the way that Jesus is described to John in the book of Revelation. So let's look really quickly at Revelation chapter 1. I just want you to see this. Revelation 1, and by the way, Zach and I have talked about this before, but anytime people hear Revelation, they automatically get a little bit scared, and I understand. Revelation is good news, right? That, that it talks about the final defeat of evil. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 12. This is John writing. Remember, John at this point has been exiled to Patmos. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. See how remarkably close it is? So the way that this individual is described is very similar to what John sees, but there is also sufficient evidence to show that it's not Jesus, and what we're going to show you that here in just a little bit. It could be that this is just an angelic being, because remember, Ezekiel is in the exact same time of exile, and in the beginning of exile, he is seated on the banks of a canal, and in Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 2, he ends up seeing uh, some angelic beings also wearing white, also with the belt of gold. So we're not 100% sure who this individual is, but there is evidence that it's Jesus, and there's evidence that it's not, and you'll see that played out more here in a little bit. Uh, yeah, so diving in, um, where are we at? Um, okay, so Daniel, uh, because of this great conflict, because of what is revealed to Daniel, he seems to be troubled about something, uh, to be mourning about something, about what, uh, kind of has been revealed to him, and so he goes into this, uh, this state of period of, of what I would call humbleness before the Lord, in which we'll get into later in the passage, what is stated, I think it's verse 12. Uh, but Daniel humbles himself in this moment, and he's abstaining from eating much of meat, drinking much of wine. He's dedicating kind of this his life to kind of the spiritual discipline and having some focused prayer, some focused time, and asking God for discernment about what exactly is going on, especially with his beloved country, uh, Israel. And so he, he's in this time, asked for discernment, and God's going to send this message. And like Justin said, it raises a lot of questions because we don't know who this person is. Uh, we don't know. He's not named. Uh, scholars can think that it's uh, an archangel known as Gabriel, but we don't know that for certain. And so uh, this this messenger that's sent and his appearance that is sent it's it, it reflects uh, kind of the kingdom of God and it shows God's glory and how God uh, creates these beings. Uh, but it shows God's glory, uh, if, as you can see, as the light shines on, uh, his eyes are, are are bright, and that's it's the most beautiful thing. But we get a little, but Daniel gets to see a little bit of glimpse of. Uh, the, this this heavenly being, and because of that, you will see kind of uh, what happens to Daniel in this moment as this messenger comes to him. Check out verse 7. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, 
For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. So Daniel alone is the guy seeing this happen. Apparently, as he stands near that river, he's not by himself. There is a group of individuals standing around him, but only Daniel is the one that sees what's going on. None of these other guys can see it. That's not uncommon. You do see in scripture elsewhere where people will... One person will experience a spiritual event that other people don't see. Probably the other great example of that would be Acts chapter 9, which is when Saul is on the road to Damascus and Jesus appears before him and that great light knocks Saul off his horse. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Only Saul can see and hear that, right? The guys around him see Saul knocked down, but they can't hear the voice. So it is entirely possible for God to only speak this to one person and the other people can see what's going on. So you see that happening here and you definitely see it happening with Saul later. But these other guys um, know that something incredible is happening. So they go and they hide. Right? They're scared to death. And honestly, that's a pretty realistic response. I mean, that would be a pretty scary thing to see. Mm -hmm. But Daniel even, as holy as he is, can't stand up. He falls to the ground. Mm -hmm. And that's because even in the presence of God, right, the holiest of men don't measure up to like God's standards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you see this happening too in the garden when Jesus is arrested. So one of my all-time favorite passages of the book of John is when the mob comes to arrest Jesus and they say, uh, and Jesus says, who are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus says, I am he, right? Literally, he just says, I am. And all the mob gets knocked down on their back. And that's because like in the presence of God, right, everyone, no one can stand, right? So Daniel, as righteous as he is, falls down and he is also terrified as to what's going on. Uh, so this is spiritually deep and only Daniel's mm -hmm. experiencing it. But I think there's something that we need to learn there is that Daniel saw what he saw. Mm -hmm. And so we can trust the accuracy of this because you're not hearing it from a bunch of different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. right? You're only hearing it from this one guy that saw it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Daniel, uh, in kind of this messenger, it, it coming to Daniel in this time of, of seeking discernment, seeking spiritual guidance, uh, and the other people standing around the river, uh, they... Uh, experience this too, but they run and they hide and they're scared. And like just said, natural reaction. I probably would have done the same thing too. A lot of times, even if if this is an angel, um, you see where angels come, they say, do not fear or do not be afraid. I'm not gonna lie, probably gonna be afraid. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so as comes these people run and hide, but where we see Daniel is that Daniel's in awe and Daniel even himself like falls into like this trance. He he kind of loses strength in this moment uh, by this messenger coming to him uh, to reveal these things that God wants um, him to know. So look at verse 10. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he, that would be this figure that's before him, and he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words had been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for the days yet to come. So one little thing, that last line there of verse 14, the visions for the days yet to come, the visions what's recorded in chapter 11. So again, remember, this is just the setup. We're not getting a lot of vision detail at this point, mm -hmm. so you didn't miss anything mm -hmm. okay it's a foreshadow he's going to tell you here just a little bit but going back up there he said daniel is stood upright remember he had fallen down and mm -hmm. just with a single hand 
Okay, this individual gives him strength and sets him on his feet. Stand mm -hmm. up, Daniel, right? Stand up, right, so that I can tell you what's going on here, right? It's a respect thing, but also with your face to the ground, I don't want you to misunderstand me, mm -hmm. okay? So stand up, right? He says he sets him on his feet. Notice he says, oh, Daniel, man, greatly loved. That is now the second time Daniel's been reminded that he's greatly loved. Mm -hmm. And every time Daniel's reminded he's loved, it's right before he's getting ready to get some sort of grand revelation of what is getting ready to happen, okay? So God is reminding him, I am telling you this because I love you, okay? Mm -hmm. You are incredibly loved. And by the way, that's not a cocky thing to understand that you're loved. Daniel's being reminded here, but later on, John outright says, right, and calls himself, the one whom Jesus loved. That's not cocky. There's a beautiful confidence that comes when you know that you're loved by God. Right? That's what he wants known. And so he's reminding Daniel here, right? You are greatly loved. He says, uh, understand the words I speak to you and stand upright for now I've been sent to you. Daniel is then stood upright and notice later on down in verse 12, he says, I have come because of your words. Okay, we cannot miss that. Mm -hmm. Remember that Daniel has been persistent in prayer. Mm -hmm. This angelic being has been sent to Daniel because Daniel prayed. Mm -hmm. Persistence in prayer is unbelievably important, mm -hmm. okay? Prayer, this right here shows us without question that prayer is not just something you do to make yourself feel better. Mm -hmm. That prayer actively in right, we're asking God to become a part of our situation and, and persistent prayer is incredibly key right mm -hmm. how many times have we missed out on something God is going to do because we just stopped being persistent in prayer mm -hmm. right there might be times where we're missing out on experiencing maybe something like this because we prayed once now God can work through one prayer I'm not saying he can't but in this moment we are learning what it means to consistently come and pray Daniel you are greatly loved and I am a messenger from God coming to you because you've not stopped praying mm -hmm. I want you to see an answer to this now keep in mind Daniel has not forced God's hand this is not well okay you know you've sent so many letters I can't you know you've sent so many prayers to me I, I can't really do anything about it mm -hmm. it's like it's like the movie Shawshank Redemption when Andy Dufresne is writing to the state senate to raise money for the library he skips, he just sends so many letters they realize they can't stop him anymore that's not what this is within God's plan he is going to tell Daniel what's happening here but at the exact same time his persistence in prayer has shown his heart of faith so he can handle receiving a message like this mm -hmm. so persistent prayer is key when later on like in first Thessalonians when Paul says pray without ceasing this is kind of what he has in mind mm -hmm. all right persistent prayer is absolutely key it's not just so you make yourself mm -hmm. feel better mm -hmm. okay and it's not just something you do to check off your list Right? It is going before God because you know the importance of communicating with him. Okay, It's one thing to pray. It's another to real, have a solid motivation behind the prayer mm -hmm. as well. And so it says, I have come because of your words. Now, here's where things get a little bit confusing. Keep in mind, earlier on, we weren't exactly sure who this person is. One of the theories is Jesus. Okay, another theory, like Zach said, it, it could be somebody like Gabriel or an angelic messenger. We don't know. Let me show you here the evidence that this is an angel and probably not Jesus. Okay, look at this. Verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for the days yet to come. What we end up figuring out here is that this prince of Persia is probably some sort of demonic force, okay? So the, this idea of prince, okay, carries the, carries the notion of, like, authority. A prince is one in authority, this prince of Persia is clearly an evil force because he has withstood God's angelic messenger and has tried to prevent the word of God from coming to Daniel. So this prince of Persia figure is clearly some sort of evil force, okay? How do we know then that this person coming to Daniel is not Jesus? Well, because of right here, verse 13 the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Okay? 
if this is Jesus, it's pre-incarnate. What that means is pre-human form mm -hmm. of Jesus, okay? I don't know why the pre-human Jesus would need help with something. There are moments, right, in Jesus' earthly ministry where you see the angels coming and ministering to him, mm -hmm. like after he's been tempted in the wilderness. But this is pre-human Jesus. I don't know why he would need help with anything. Right? Why would Michael, who is the name of an angel, by the way, Michael always comes up um, when it when it comes to like the battle of good and evil. You can read Jude verse nine. I say that because Jude's only one chapter long. Um, you can you can see where Michael's brought up in the battle between good and evil. It's probably not Jesus because Jesus wouldn't need help. Right? Jesus can openly withstand demonic forces. This individual needs help doing so. So that probably tells us it's not Jesus, but it is some sort of messenger sent by God. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other thing too, it says one of the chief princes, uh, Michael. Now, if you're familiar with angelic names, Zach brought up Gabriel, you hear about Michael. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, notice he's called a chief prince. So does that mean there is a hierarchy of angels? Yes. Okay, there is some sort of order of rank, if you will, of angels. Um, you can read Ephesians 1, you can read Ephesians 6, you can read Colossians 1 and figure out that there is some sort of order. But within that hierarchy of angels, there's a hierarchy of faithful angels and there's a hierarchy of evil mm -hmm. angels as well. So the person withstanding the chief faithful angel has been a chief evil angel. Okay, this tells you what you need to know about spiritual warfare as well. This is real stuff. And I get that like people get freaked out about spiritual warfare and things like that. These things are real. Mm -hmm. There's a spiritual realm and there are forces of good and there are forces of evil. And this gives you a little bit of a clue as to what's going on here. So we don't know who the person is. We do know that he's some sort of chief angelic messenger who is fighting the forces of evil here. Okay, that's kind of where we find ourselves. Yeah. Um, so Daniel, and what we see about Daniel is that he's humble within his prayer. It's not that Daniel is coming to God, uh, selfishly wanting to know, but Daniel is humble before the Lord while he's persistent in his prayer. And what I, I find, um, interesting too, is that it's the motivation from God because he does it out of love. Uh, for his creation. He does that out of love for his people, Israel, and for his beloved, uh, faithful servant, Daniel. That's why God does these very things, because God truly loves Daniel. And because Daniel is humble, because he's persistent in his prayer, God loves him dearly. And so he sends this messenger for clarity uh, to give Daniel a word uh, and, and this reveal word and vision uh, to him about well, what exactly is going on. Um, and as that's kind of happening, um, we see that kind of what may be confusing, kind of like verse 13, uh, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia uh, opposed me for, for 21 days. Why was it 21 days? Who is the prince of Persia? Like just said, it's probably uh, something demonic. It's probably a, a worker for Satan. Satan means adversary. And so, um, so what we learn, especially in this, especially in, in chapter 10, is that, hey, there's a spiritual battle that's going on that we cannot necessarily see, but we know from scripture that it's happening because that's what the message they're fighting. That's what Michael's there fighting. And so there's a spiritual battle that is going on. And I think it's important that we know that we shouldn't neglect uh, the spiritual battle that's happening, but we should know that, hey, there is one that's it's going on and that there's, there's a battle between good and evil, but yet God is working on our behalf, our, on our behalf for us, for our good and sending these messengers, sending these angels uh, to fight battles for us on our behalf, for our good. And so that's something we probably shouldn't neglect and we should acknowledge, hey, there is a spiritual battle that's happening. There is something uh, these people uh, are these beings that are, are, are going on my behalf fighting for me. So check out verse 15. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, and I said to him who stood before me, 
O my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. So I want you to know, like Daniel's activity here, he's been very physically active while this mm -hmm. has been. He started down, then he was up, now he's down again. Okay, and then what we're going to see is this angelic messenger will pick him back up. So he's, you know, prostrating and standing up, prostrating and standing up just as these things come about. Really only one thing I want to point out here is right here in verse 16 when it says, Oh my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me. Maybe yours says struggles or something. That Hebrew word, because remember we're back in the Hebrew language here. Daniel's in two languages, Hebrew and Aramaic. We're back in the Hebrew language here. When he brings up right that word struggles, it's actually the word they would use like for like going into labor, like birth pains and things. So as this is being revealed to Daniel, he is physically struggling with it as well as spiritually struggling with it. He, he this news is so difficult for him to take mm -hmm. in. It's almost as if he's feeling labor pains mm -hmm. and things like that. So know too that this is very difficult for Daniel to receive as much as it is for the angelic messenger mm -hmm. to tell him what's mm -hmm. going on. Yeah, uh, like Justin said before, and if you can kind of get a picture of what Daniel is experiencing here, because this is what he wants you to see. He wants you to hear how uh, he's feeling in this moment. It, it, it's like He's he, he's struggling to grasp for air. He he's in in shock of kind of what is happening, what he he he's hearing, what he's about to hear, and so he has no strength in him. He can he can hardly speak. But what we see in kind of what's going to happen, kind of in this kind of last portion, is is the regaining of his strength to speak. So let's look here, verses eighteen through the end here. And again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And he said, Do you know why I've come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael your prince. So what you end up having, what you have here is Daniel's feeling a lot of pain, but notice there in verse 18, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. That's not God. That's God working through his messenger mm -hmm. to simply with the touch, reach out and completely mm -hmm. give Daniel his strength back mm -hmm. with one touch. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's the beautiful, intimate power of our God, mm -hmm. right? With one single touch working through someone else, God can restore, right? Uh, the, the strength. And Notice, too, that the man says, now do you understand why I've come to you? Okay, mm -hmm. the big question here is, why would God allow this conflict to happen? Because you've got this angelic messenger who's come before Daniel saying, I've been fighting. Mm -hmm. I've, been with, I've been withstanding all these attacks. And he says at the end here, and now I'm going back to not only fight the prince of Persia, but also fight the prince of Greece. Mm -hmm. So there's another demonic force mm -hmm. that, that's going to be coming around. So he says, I'm going out and fighting. The question is, why wouldn't God just do away with the conflict? Right? Because he could mm -hmm. very easily. God, with a snap of a finger, could just do away right with the these demonic attacks and win hands down. Okay? God allows this to happen because he's got a purpose in allowing it to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay? Daniel's persistence in prayer, which we've talked about, you see God drawing out his answer so not to make Daniel squirm or anything like that, but so that Daniel will keep trusting him, right? Mm -hmm. You've trusted me this far. You've been persistent in prayer thus far. Mm -hmm. Now let me show you what else I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. So God allows these things to happen because he's got a purpose in it. Mm -hmm. It's not because you've got to activate him or try and mm -hmm. wear him down, mm -hmm. okay? He is doing so because Daniel's been persistent and he wants him to continue being, mm -hmm. okay? Now I want you to notice too, like Zach said, God is still fighting, Mm -hmm. Right for Israel, and apparently this Michael individual and whoever this guy is here in Daniel chapter ten mm -hmm. are teaming up to fight these demonic forces. Mm -hmm. So Israel may feel completely alone in the world, but yeah. they have an incredibly large backbone yeah. um, in God fighting for them. And mm -hmm. so the stage has been set for as we get into chapter eleven, mm -hmm. you'll hear what the vision is going to be. Yeah. Uh, so Daniel is restrengthened again by the power of God. Um, 
And so when he's strengthened, we, we see that God has a purpose in sending this messenger. And that's what we'll get into kind of in, in the next chapter. Uh, but what we see is that the, this angel, this angelic being is going to return to fight on behalf of Israel with Michael. So he's going to return back to the spiritual battle. But in, in what we get in this closing is that Daniel can trust God once more. Daniel can find his strength in God once more because God has strengthened him. Uh, and so that's what we're going to see kind of as we kind of come to these closing chapters. But also is that with Israel itself is they too should trust God once more. So... And with that, we conclude chapter 10. If you've got questions, comments, concerns, the email's in the description of the video. The study guide is in the description of the video. Two services on Sunday. We are beginning a series called Reflect, all about what it means to be imitators of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so we are doing that with two other churches in the area. It's our tri-church series. That What happens is we will preach, and then all the ministers from three different churches will swap pulpits throughout the series. So they'll, other churches will get to hear from me. You'll get to hear from these other pastors. And uh, we're praying that God's going to do some incredible things through that. So one little date to keep on your radar is August 4th, which is the giant tri-church cookout at Tolsboro at 6. And we'll continue reminding you of that as we move forward. I'll have Zach pray us out, and we'll be dismissed and see you next week. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this time we get to have. Uh, God, open our minds and our hearts to what we heard from your prophet Daniel. Uh, what it means to know that there's a spiritual battle going on, but yet, God, all through it, uh, you're strengthening us and you're, you're calling us to trust you once more. So, God, let us place our trust in you. Let us be strengthened throughout our day and throughout our week. We pray this in your heavenly name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Have a great week.